Honourable councillors, officers, members of the public and press, welcome to the meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee on the 10th of January 2021. And I'll extend um, Happy New Year to um, all officers, councillors and members of the public um, for 2021, and hopefully it's better um, year than last year. The meeting is in a remote meeting being structured and recorded. So I'll hand over to the Democratic Services team. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Good morning, everyone. Um, we'll just begin the meeting by way of a roll call. Uh, those in attendance remotely, and may I request that members confirm that they have a copy of the agenda papers and can both hear and see councillors in the meeting. Councillor Buchan. Yes, I have all the necessary papers. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy? Yes to all. Thank you. Councillor Hall, Chair, yes or no? Yes to all. Yeah. Councillor Hamilton? Yes, I've got everything, thanks, Dave. Thank you. Councillor Harrison? Yes, I've also got everything, thank you. Thank you. Councillor James? Morning. I have, I have access to all of the papers, I believe, anyway, and I can see and hear. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Lyons. Uh, yes, to all. Thank you. In relation to standards, corporate members, do we have either Parish Council or Little Fair or O'Brien with us? No. Claire Wilson? Yes, and I've got the information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no representative from the police that I can see online. We also have joining us in the meeting Councillor Tony Richardson. Okay. Excuse me, thanks. Thank you. That uh, concludes the uh, roll call. Uh, can I just remind members about keeping their microphones on mute, mute during the meeting just to um, reduce the background noise as we proceed? Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks very much, uh, David. Um, first item is apologies for absence. I think we've got a full um, rotor rot at the moment. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Very, good. very good indeed. Um, received declarations of interest by members. Any declarations? Uh, none. Um, Minister confirmed the meeting, the, the minutes of the meeting held on the um, 23rd of November 2020. I mean, approved those. Okay. 3.2 confirmed the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of December to follow. I think they were out um, yesterday. Yes, they were sent out yesterday. Okay. That's pretty much indeed. Confirm those. Okay. So, I'm going to change the uh, agenda items at the moment. Um, can we turn to 6.2 from Craig Bundred's coronavirus and Hardy Pool update? Yeah, good morning. Thanks, Chair. And, uh, apologies for, for changing the agenda, but I do have to shoot off to another meeting straight afterwards. So. Um, that's, that's great. Thanks for, for accommodating that. Yeah, I'm going to run through. I'll just try and share my screen as I have a presentation to run through uh, just to update you on our current position uh, as regards the COVID situation. Uh, is that everyone able to see that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we've got the presentation there. Fantastic. I'll just see if this works. Uh, so, yeah, so as I've mentioned today, I'll just give you a, a, a very quick update. Um, you'll be aware from all of the media reports as to the, the current situation as to where we are. So I'm going to run through some of the, the figures with you and um, just outline some of the key challenges we've got at the moment. As you'll all be aware, um, the, the number of cases has been rising uh, across the country and also particularly in Hartlepool as well. The slide there shows you our case rate per 100,000 population with the England figure in green, which is the low one, uh, and Hartlepool in blue, which is the higher one. As you can see, since October, we've had um, quite a significant uh, increase in the number of, um, in the case rate per 100,000. 
uh, particularly Hartlepool still tracking above the England average rate as well at the moment. Looking at the cases, um, you'll see we've got a, a, a fairly similar um, sort of spread of cases. Um, match the top graph there is the England um, cases, and the bottom one is is Hartlepool cases. Um, you'll see, as you can see, we've had a, a peak in November um, following the, 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 the last sort of major lockdown where we saw a, a decline in the number of cases. Uh, but since then, we've started to see um, quite a significant increase, which is, is quite worrying. In terms of the rolling averages, again, uh, England at the top and Hartlepool at the bottom, um, you know, you can see the, the, the climb there. Um, we use rolling averages to spread out the peaks and troughs of um, the, the number of cases and tests coming through on a daily or weekly basis. But um, as you can see, even the rolling averages that shows we've, we've had quite a significant um, rise in the number of cases there in the showing in the bottom graph. It does match uh, the, the, the pattern um, of England cases, but we are still with our average rate tracking uh, per 100,000 still above the England rate as well. Subsequently, that we would expect to see an increase in the, the death rate as well. Uh, and we've seen a slow uh, but steady increase um, over the last sort of few weeks as well. And again, uh, the rates which have consistently uh, tracked higher than the the England death rate per hundred thousand. Um, it hasn't. It looks like it's starting to diverge a little bit there, and I think that that reflects some of the increasing uh, cases we're seeing. But again, it has tracked fairly consistently across the the course of the pandemic. So we've looked up to December 2020, the density of COVID cases. And again, I think those of you who've attended and, and seen some of my previous um, sort of presentations will see that this is probably still reflects um, what we, we've seen in the past, which is the, the spread of through the, throughout the town, the darker areas with the more uh, higher density, but that reflects where we are in terms of population as well. Um, and I think what we do see is um, the, the, the cases that they, they do sort of tend to, as you would expect with a, a, a virus, tend to sort of concentrate in certain areas where the infection moves around. And I think we've, we've had um, sort of quite hot spots in, in Seaton Carew, for example, which is now um, not as high a number of cases and, and they have moved around some of the areas in terms of the density. Um, and we would expect that given the nature of the, the transmission and, and where these, these hotspots um, sort of break out. We are able to track that and um, able to sort of direct any um, interventions we, we have to, to those places. So it's quite useful intelligence to do that. One of the challenges we've had um, of late is, has been the uptake of testing. Before Christmas, we did see um, a decline in the number of people who were taking tests. And I think what we felt that was a result of was people not wanting to to, to potentially isolate over Christmas or um, have to or be ill or think they consider themselves ill over Christmas. Uh, we've seen that start to rise again following Christmas. And I'll, have, I'll mention a, a few points around um, the impact of the, the the most recent couple of weeks on on our case rate at the moment. So what we're seeing. Uh, are, and, and the density of tests again, um, we're getting looking at a more even spread uh, around the town at the moment. So I think we did see some uh, quite um, big sort of spots where where there wasn't a high uptake of testing, and I think really that's what something we have to encourage is people to get tested. Um, it's the only way we're really going to 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 really suppress the virus is to test pe to people. And, and support them to isolate if they test positive. So it's encouraging that we're starting to see a, a pickup in the number of, of tests in, in one way. But I think, again, it, it's slightly discouraging because of the reasons why in, in the, the most recent um, period. But uh, I can talk about, about that in a minute, as I said. So we are, um, as you'll probably be aware from the, the national publicity and um, what's in the news and at the moment, um, you know, we are seeing a big increase uh, in the, in recent times, both nationally, regionally, and locally, uh, the tables there show the count of all cases from December the fifth in the top table. So for Hartlepool, uh, we had around about 205 cases, which was a rate of 219 um, cases per hundred thousand. So these are the seven-day rates. Uh, and in the bottom, that's January the third, and you can see it's gone up to 671 and a rate of 716 per hundred thousand. So that's quite a significant rate. Unfortunately, we are um, looking at having the highest rate currently 
in the northeast, um, which is a concern for us and it is still increasing. Uh, as you can see, we've got higher than the Tees Valley average as well. I think one thing to note is that um, other areas are increasing quite rapidly as well. Um, but I think our rates have increased to, to a, a higher level than, than other areas. The over 60s is an important rate to consider, particularly for the vulnerability of the over 60s. We need to track that, but also because it's one of the metrics that we're measured on. Um, you can see over the over 60s there um, has increased as well um, from 87 per 100,000 to 464 per 100,000. I think the caveat um, with some of these figures is that we do have a small population. So when we look at measurement by the, of the rate per 100,000, there can be some quite small numbers will cause a big fluctuation in the rates. However, the, the, the point I think I'd like to make with this is that our rates are exceedingly higher than uh, other areas and that is a concern. So again, these are the looking at the metrics. Of, <clears throat> excuse me for the COVID tiers and how they're changing. This is the positivity, so that's the number, the proportion of tests that are carried out that are uh, positive. And you can see our positivity rate has gone up from the 5th of December there for comparison, which was 10.4% to 23.9% now. So again, that's a higher proportion of the tests that are coming through are uh, testing positive and that's sort of a function of the the number of people we're getting through um, who into testing itself uh, so it's a possible indication that we do need to in increase the number of people coming through the testing process so we want to push the message that you know if people feel they've got symptoms at all any any symptoms to not delay and to to get tested as soon as they possibly can so i'm going to try and end that um, and stop presenting. Has that gone off now? It has. It has. Excellent. So I think the picture is is um, quite stark with the data there. I think one of the things we're seeing at the moment um, is the Christmas effect, Christmas and New Year effect coming through. The sort of average incubation period is five to six days for from infection to um, symptoms manifesting themselves. So I think we're starting to see um, in the last few days a significant impact from Christmas mixing, which is driving, I suspect we'll be driving our figures. But also I think in the, from yesterday to probably the end of the week and the weekend, we're likely to see the impact of uh, New Year as well, where we suspect that there has been mixing over New Year. And I think certainly yesterday the figures I saw were um, quite excessive in terms of the numbers, the daily numbers that were were presented to us and I think that's uh, a function of uh, mixing over the Christmas and New Year period unfortunately so I think we're, we're likely to see that normally I'd be expecting to say that the, the the tier four we went into prior to Christmas would start to have an effect by now and um, certainly the lockdown measures that we're seeing uh, that we've gone into would be likely to be having an effect in the next week or so but I'm concerned that actually the mixing uh, over Christmas is going to draw that out a bit longer uh, so we're anticipating seeing further rises as we go through the week. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but um, you know we, we we do anticipate that's likely to happen. So I think it's just fair to say that we we flag that up as, at this point in time as well. So unfortunately, that's that's not the best news. Unfortunately, I'm afraid to come and give you, but um, you know I think that's the current positions to where we're at, and um, you know the, the 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 there are some um, sort of um, bright spots on the horizon. But I think the message I'm putting off, putting out there is that we cannot let our guard down. We are in quite a, a, a serious place with the rates being the highest in the northeast. You know, it, we're working to try and bring those down, but everyone has their bit to play. Uh, we really have to uh, ensure that everybody abides by the lockdown uh, regulations, the lockdown actions, because that is literally the only way we are going to be able to um, bring the numbers down. You know, it's a, it's a, um, a virus that's transmitted by social contact. We need to remember all of the um, advice about keeping social distancing, not mixing households, not mixing at all, um, good hand hygiene and maintaining mask wearing, where face covering wearing where it's appropriate. All of those very simple to do. And it, it really is that simple to be able to try and bring the numbers down. And we have to, to reflect on that. Thank Thanks you. very much, uh, Craig. Um, Marjorie. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to ask Craig, the um, the figures that you've produced for Hartlepool uh, go up until the 3rd of January, I believe, you, you said on the yeah. uh, slides. 
and yet um, on the 4th of January, which was Monday, um, the information that comes up in at the news points uh, on the TV had Hartlepool at 750. Um, and I don't quite understand the discrepancies in that because it just confuses people that what they're being told visually is it's 750 on Monday, but I think you had 714 or something like that for uh, the Sunday, which would be the third. Um, yeah. and can it's I, increasing. Sorry. And can I also ask, I mean, the the map that you've got where you have the hot spots across the town do, as far as I can tell, follow quite closely to the deprivation arrangements within the town. Um, and I'm concerned that um, the test centres that we have, and I think we have three now, yeah. um, there aren't any that would deal with things like Manor House Ward or Rossmere. Uh, there just aren't any. Uh, so we're actually asking people who believe that they may be ill to either get on a bus, because a lot of them do not have cars, to get on a bus or to walk into town or to get somebody to, to bring them in, which is just not possible. So the problem is that unless we actually do something about getting a test centre at the south end of the town, and preferably sort of in the hub or something like that, which would put it right in the centre of Manor House Ward, then those individuals are not going to attend for testing which means that they will then convince themselves that they are not ill, they don't actually have COVID, and they will continue to do what they normally do, which just spreads it even more. Uh, there are also a number of complaints, and I, and I know that this is not really in your bag, but I'll say it while I'm speaking, is that there are huge discrepancies and unfairnesses in the tier system that's been brought in and even the lockdown uh, that we're now under. Um, and I would just give you the example that if if I went somewhere to pick up a meal, to still do out uh, meals to take out, I cannot buy a bottle of wine with my meal and take it home. But I can go into Tesco's or Asda or Morrison's or anywhere else, and I can buy as much alcohol as I like. And it's just completely unacceptable that those discrepancies are there. You know, I mean. I've witnessed myself over the Christmas period, people walking around in Tesco's with trolley loads of trays of drink and wine and everything else in their trolley. And, uh, you know, it's quite clear that people are having parties. Um, and yet that's not supposed to be happening. And yet there doesn't really seem to be anything being done about that. Thank you. OK, I'll, uh, if I can address those points. Yeah. Um, the first one was about the, the figures, wasn't it? Yes. I think, yeah, the, the average, obviously, clearly the, the, the seven-day rolling average figures we use change on a daily basis. So the, the, if we put the figures up to, to um, Sunday, what happens is um, generally there's a four to three to four-day lag on the data that comes in to us and into Public Health England because of the way the testing process works. So we can get data coming through but it's actually, um, it can change. So what we generally use is the, the data that comes through from PHE. Um, I get to see, myself and my team get to see where we're up to with the, the most recent days. So I could give you a figure, for example, for yesterday, but I would probably be able to say that, you know, give it a couple of days, it'll have changed um, depending on the, the, you know, whether we use sample data or reporting data or, or various, so there's various different ways of using it. So we try to get that consistent approach, which, um, has where we know the data is the most up to date, if that makes sense, um, to report on. Um, and you know there are there is, and I think there is a various different um, reporting methods that are used by different organisations as well. We try to retain a consistent approach for ours, so that when we give you information, you know it's actually the same as the last time that we we presented it. So it's really just to, to get that most accurate and up-to-date information, because I do know, and I can say that, you know, in the last few days, it does look likely that the, the rate is increasing as well, um, you know, up from that 700 and, and was it 714, I think we had on the the, the data. So I'm, I'm fairly, well, very confident that it will be higher now than it was uh, on that. But obviously, I can't give you the exact um, number, because it's obviously, you know, depending on all of the data coming through from the test centres, um 
you know, there is that that lag, uh, which causes us not to be able to give a very accurate um, representation until um, it's been so sorted centrally. So that's kind of why there's a discrepancy. But I would expect it, you know, the Monday reporting to be higher, given the trajectory we're on at the moment. So um, that's the reason for, for the difference in those figures. Um, testing, wasn't it, the test sites? Um, I agree. I think um, we do have the, the two local test sites. Um, the NHS, or the, not as NHS, Serco, um, Deloitte, who, who we're working with to put the testing sites in place. There was a, a stop on the development of new sites, but it's something I'll take back and see whether there is an option to, to look at um, whether they've restarted that program again with the local test sites. Um, I think it, it, it's a valid point about that the deprivation, and I think you're right because it, it does track um, th those areas. And I think it's it's something that is on our radar in terms of um, you know supporting people to to be able to test, to be able to, to and also to be able to um, take the necessary actions following a positive result. So it's certainly something on my radar. Unfortunately, we won't we don't have the capacity, or nationally the government won't give us the capacity to put testing centres everywhere we would like to. But um, it's a particularly valid point. It's something I am a bit concerned about in terms of where we are actually, you know, being able to access testing. I think one of the things also, I think, given that the, the rise does seem to be in those areas is, is if we can't get a test site, it's looking at how we can support people to access testing in a, uh, you know, in a, uh, an easier way. Uh, and I think the the last point, yes, I don't think there's, there isn't a lot I can do about that, unfortunately. Um, and I, but I think that's one of the vagaries, I think, of the the um, the system uh, with with lockdown regulations, in terms of what's available. And I, I do, you know, I think I haven't checked the legal. I think it was voted through last night, so I haven't had a chance to to have a look at exactly the specifics either. But um, there there will be. Um, different requirements, I think, for different um, shops and restaurants and that sort of thing in terms of um, the, the alcohol sales, for example, because I think there has been some contention with those in the past, because I do think um, that, that it was a, there were restrictions around takeaway um, alcohol from pubs and things like that. So I think the alcohol side is a bit complex at the moment as well, with various different regulations for different um, sort of sectors but I do agree that it is um, it's not straightforward and I think that that does reflect uh, some of the feedback I've been getting from people is that you know this is one of the challenges we have in asking people um, to, to to work within these regulations is the the messaging and I agree and I think you know we're looking at how we put our messages out um, because we have had some feedback from various different sectors about the things like social bubbles, for example, and what you can and can't do. So I think we, we, we're looking to do work now to, to try and simplify that for people and, and make it a lot easier than some of the, the guidance that's coming out. But yeah, it's a valid point, very valid. Thank you. Councillor Brenda Harrison. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I'd just like to echo what Marjorie said about the um, test centre um, and, and what Craig said. I think that um, that uh, south of the of the town um, are completely sort of bereft um, of that. Um, and, and we seem to have, um, we're doing very well in the north of the town. Um, so it would be good if that could be spread out. Um, the the I would also like to just comment on the um, enforcement. I think um, I understand that the enforcement is there and that police are actually taking action. But I think the first time they um, come across somebody who is breaking the rules, as it were, um, they get a warning, um, which is then tracked, and then they will enforce whatever after that. Personally, I don't think that warning should exist. I think that people know that they're breaking the rules um, by having a party, and if they're caught, I think they should be, enforcement should be put in straight away. But that's my, that's my view. Um, but I think they are trying to do something. What I wanted to ask Craig is um, about the vaccinations. Um, and I know that we're doing very well in Hartlepool uh, in getting the vaccinations out. Um, but I just wondered um, when the key workers, have you any idea of the, of the time um, when the, the key workers would have these vaccinations? Because to me, that's really very important. 
Um, and, and when I say key workers, I'm talking about everybody who is concerned with working with the public in the public domain. So, for example, shopkeepers, um, people on transport, uh, bus drivers and so on. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to particularly um, uh, refer to, to schools because um, I, I'm under the impression, and I, I'm, I'm not saying this is absolutely gospel, but um, the impression I'm getting is that some schools are insisting that all their staff go in, even though the uh, children um, are not all going in, obviously. Um, in the first lockdown, what happened in schools tended to be on a rotor basis, so staff weren't all in at the same time, but they were doing a rotor um, basis kind of uh, approach. Um, and I can't understand why that isn't continued this time. Um, I, I think it's a bit worrying that all the staff have to be it. I'm not saying this is in all schools, but I know it is in some. Um, so I, I think that's worrying and I think that needs to be looked at, Craig. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Craig, um, my hobby horse is um, COVID-19 deaths on the um, certificate. Um, I think that um, if you went into the hospital, you know, positive test, that it could be um, COPD, strokes, heart, or even winter flu, a medical positive test. I'm not sure about the uh, death certificate. It's add on COVID-19 at the end of the ailments that we've got now. Um, I, I know that the um, flu deaths in 17-18 was um, roughly about 26,000 in the country or whatever, and that was H5N8 on, on the avian flu. Um, that was uh, not, not published about the um, pressures on the NHS in 1718. But uh, can you do, can comment on, on, on the um, adding on from COVID-19 with any other ailments on, on the hospitalised at the moment, Craig? Uh, well, the, I'll, I'll pick up that, and, and, and if I may as well, I'll, I'll respond to some of um, Councillor Harrison's points as well uh, after that. But I think um, the, the death certification process is very robust um, and, you know, it's um, I, I'm not an expert on that process, but, but um, you know, it, it's, it, you know, if they believe somebody has had COVID-19 and that that, that has a a been a factor in their death, then that, that will be why it's recorded. Um, it's, it's not um, just being tagged on or anything like that. Um, for, 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 for whatever reason. So we do know that, you know, that is an influence and if it influences, it will be recorded. We, we sort of had guidance from PHE um, around this and they're very clear that that's, you know, it, it will be recorded where it is a factor in that person's death. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Um, um, Leslie. Councillor Hamilton. Sorry. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, thank you, Chair. I just want to add um, to what um, Brenda's just said about the schools. And um, I heard something really concerning the other day that um, in some schools, and these are academy schools, um, teachers are working from home and they are sending in teaching assistants in order to support children who are from homes where uh, parents are essential workers. Now, you know, we have this awful system with schools and information that came out on the news the other day was that teachers are now looking three times more likely to be at risk of COVID than um, other um, areas where we've got essential workers. My concern is this though, how come um, schools are allowed to inform teachers to remain at home and work from home Yes, they're happy to send in two years in order to manage the herd, if you like. Are teaching assistants less important than teachers? Are they putting them in the firing line um, because, you know, they're just two years and um, the teachers should be protected from home? I find that really offensive. You know, teachers and tears do remarkable work in schools. 
And I don't think there should be a tier system there either. I don't know if you can comment on that um, in relation to how the government's putting out information to schools, but I'm just really concerned that academies, certain academies, think that this is okay. I'm, I, I'm not aware of um, any of the detail with schools, I'm afraid, at the moment around what their, their staffing requirements are, but um, I could pass that up the chain to, to find out what exactly is happening with that. Um, I'll talk to Sally and, and see if there's any information. I'm not aware of, I wasn't aware of any of that happening, if I'm honest, um, but I sort of echo your... It's in the academies. It's in the, yeah. I believe it's just in the, well, the person I know is, works in an academy and it's happening to them. Yeah, um, but I'll, I'll I'll flag that with Sally and see if if there's anything we 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 can find out about that. Um, but I, I do agree with your point though that the teachers at, and and all staff in schools at the moment are, are sort of doing an ex exceptional job with with sort of you know working to to support the children as well. So um, you know it's um, we do need to support them because they are absolutely. doing a really a really good job. And they should all be treated the same, and that doesn't seem to be the case in some academies currently. So thank you, Craig. That would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Lyons. Thank you, oh. Chair. Um, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, going back to uh, death certificates. Um, about six weeks ago, uh, somebody who we know very well uh, informed me that um, a father-in-law had passed away uh, in hospital uh, in the local area and the, it had a, a COVID test the day or two beforehand and it came back negative. On the morning that he passed away, he had another test and that came back negative. But on his death certificate, they wanted to put coronavirus, death by COVID. Um, the family fought this because they said it has to be a closed coffin they didn't want the coffin closed. Um, eventually, they got their own way. But I just wondered how many other people this is happening to. You know, it's a bit worrying, isn't it? You know, that those figures that we've got might not be as bad as what they are. Um, it's down to the actual GP or the consultant or whatever. Um, so I just thought I'd highlight that, you know, that it, 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 it's caused me concern. Um, also, before Christmas, I was in hospital and uh, the, it, it's dire. The, the, the beds, I mean, the ward I was on, they said there's absolutely no female beds whatsoever. I was told I'd be in over Christmas to prepare myself. Um, in the end, I was let out on the 22nd of December, which was great. I didn't want to be in hospital. But that's how bad it is in North Tees. Um, they are working around the clock. They are never stopping. Mm. The nurses, the doctors are doing a fantastic job. And I've thanked them all very much for what they've done. Um, it was a constant stream of patients coming in and going out and moving about. Actually, from the Sunday to the Tuesday, I was on three wards <laughs> uh, because they needed the beds, you know what I mean. Um, and just to add to that, um, on Monday, uh, three of my family members took the test. They've all come back negative, uh, positive. Uh, I had another one on Tuesday come back positive. Uh, so now we're waiting for the sixth one, um, and we think that's positive as well. That that sh so the six in the family. So it's a bit worrying. It looks like it's only mild, but um, and I had it early on in March, April. Mine was mild compared to some, but at least I was in hospital to get the right treatment. Um, but yeah, the figures do change from day to day, and I, I appreciate what you were saying, Craig. You know, thank you. Thanks, um, Brenda. Um, Claire Wilson. Oh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Sorry, Craig, you may have been asked, well, you, you've almost certainly been asked this in meetings where I was unable to attend, but why are our figures relatively so high compared to, I know we have a lot of deprivation, but so does Middlesbrough and Redcar and places like that. Why are we so high in Hartlepool? Are we all so reckless? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a it's it's a complex picture. Um, you, you're right. I mean, we do see um, I think deprivation is driving that. I, th I think quite significantly. We we do get information which shows 
um, things like the proportion of cases, for example, within each of the, the deciles of indices of deprivation. And we, we do see that um, that is a factor, a higher factor in the higher number of cases in those those areas. It's a challenging um, picture. I mean, you know, we, we, we're not that different, I think, from across the board in terms of compliance and people complying with restrictions as well. And I think that's a challenge because I think you've got all sorts of factors that have to play into that. So, you know, housing causes issues with um, whether you can isolate, what sort of job you've got causes problems and challenges with how you, you easy you find it to, to self-isolate. And all of these factors combine um, to, put, you know, to make it really quite a complex picture. I think, you know, we, we are gaining, as we go along, we've got <clears throat> gained more of an understanding about those things that drive either compliance with, with isolation or, or things like that. Um, and so we're able to, to to look at what we can do to support people. But certainly things like economic factors will drive that. So, for example, if you're on a, 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 a zero hours contract, for example, you're going to find it difficult to to isolate if you, you know, you're you not going to have an income and things like sick pay and that side of things. So it's it's, it's a variety of different challenges that um, that the people are facing, um, you know, to 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 be able to to isolate because, you know, effectively that is the. What we have to do, people, we have to identify the cases, people who've got the the virus, and then make sure that they don't pass it on to anyone else. It's just basically simple as that. Um, but it's that's the, the the challenges are then with the the, the people who may may not be able to do that. It's um, you know, so we, we have to try and support people as, as much as we can to be able to do that. Thanks, sir, Greg. Um, Marjorie, to come in. Thank you, Chair. And can I can I just remind people that Brenda Harrison is still waiting for answers to her questions. But um, the situ the one that I want to ask, Craig, is something that uh, I mean, like other people, I'm watching the television news and listening to what's actually going on. Now, the fa the fact of the matter is that um, in a number of cases, they're now saying that you know children in families uh, where there is deprivation levels are being provided with laptops where possible but they're obviously not providing every child with a laptop but the the consequences of that are that if you've got two or three children who are who are fortunately provided with laptops and therefore you've got three laptops on the go uh, if you are in a deprived family you are going to make that you then got to make the decision as to whether you actually eat keep the house warm or the kids do their lessons because if you're on a metered electricity supply then which a lot of them are then there is a cost of running laptops for four or six hours a day two or three laptops at a time so the, but there doesn't seem to be any assistance being given to these families in order to ensure that uh, that decision that they're having to make in some cases is removed from them and and i do understand that part of the uh, hub support arrangements are that where families are in danger of losing their electricity supply because they don't have money yes we can assist them but a lot of families are unaware of that and just struggle on from one day to another but uh, it is yet another um question and an issue that these deprived families with two or three kids are having to meet and yet nobody seems to be talking about uh, the fact that there is a cost to running laptops at home especially so I said if you're a deprived community and you are you've got two or three kids mm -hmm. um, any comments from um, Brenda Harrison and um, Craig uh, yes, sorry, I'll, I'll go. I'll go back to those. Um, it was about the vaccination program, wasn't it? Ah, uh, yes, yeah. And key workers. Um, yeah, the vaccine vaccination program is being rolled out through the NHS, so I don't have all of the details. Um, I'm not sure if any of my NHS colleagues are on on the call uh, at the moment, um, but I do know that um, that there is has been a nationally set list of. Um, sort of priorities for people to be vaccinated um and, and i'm not sure whether key workers uh were were coming into that but i do know that, that that's constantly under revision uh and i would sort of um probably have to defer to my nhs colleagues as to any data or any information about that but i think you've quite quite rightly flagged up that we have been doing very well um in, in hartlepool in terms of the vaccinations uh and the numbers that have gone and i think quite a high number of uh, 
I think at one point over the Christmas period, I think we were probably top of the the, the national league table of numbers of people who were being vaccinated. So um, I think there's a really you know strong effort going into to to the vaccination program in Hartlepool, which is really positive. One of the few positives I think we have at the moment. Mm. So. Yeah, I mean, I think the government is saying um, a million people in um, a week for vaccination. That'll be a tall order, and that will be into 15 months for the full population. Mm. Okay, um, Brenda Harrison again. Yeah, thanks for that, um, Craig. Um, just to go back to what Marjorie was saying, um, she's so right, and I think that um, I understand that people are getting help with computers and routers um, because obviously that's a, a cost as well. Um, but I, I'm not sure if they're getting the same sort of help when they're getting that kind of financial uh, boost for the computers um, if, they, if they're looking at the uh, cost of the electricity. So I think that would be a good idea to, to put that into um, the whole cost that um, families are, are facing uh, with using computers at home. Um, I, I do think that what the, the kind of impression I've certainly got um, is that, we, that Hartlepool have done a very good job in attempting to get every child um, a computer so that they can do the online learning if necessary. Obviously, some children will be going into school anyway the more vulnerable children and the children of key workers. Um, so th they, they will be catered for within school. Uh, but those who aren't, um, I understand, are getting help with the, with the computer and the router, but also, maybe Craig, if, if we can put the sort of um, electricity costs in with that as well, because Marjorie mm -hmm. makes a very good point there. Sure. As yeah. usual. Um, yeah, Chair, just to say that we will take those comments up and refer them back and get a response in relation to that. Um, just to say as well that in terms of the vaccination and key workers issue, I'll endeavour to um, get some feedback for our members and circulate that outside the meeting as well. Yeah. <clears throat> I know that Craig wants to, to go at the moment because he's just meeting, I think. Um, final comment from uh, Brenda Lyons. Um, just to say that yesterday I had a, a message from my GP surgery saying that uh, they're awaiting any day now for the Oxford vaccine, which um, obviously I'm one of the top of the list. Uh, I asked if uh, my husband would get it as well uh, because we live together and yes, he will. Uh, so I'm excited to know that we're getting the Oxford uh, one because I feel keep it in England. Um, so I just thought, you know, I'd let you know that surgeries are letting the patients know. Um, and I'm of the moment that uh, I'm on that list. Okay. On, on a positive note, um, I thank for Craig to come to the meeting this morning. And uh, I know you're very busy. So um, thank you for contributions, massive contributions this morning. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Dan. Thank you. So, a different um, track on audit items. 4.1, Mazar's report, annual audit letter. Is the representative for Mazar's? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, it's Gavin here, Gavin Barker. Gavin. Good. Yes, you are. Yes. So, you, so you're on the screen now. No. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that previous item certainly puts the audit into some perspective. Um, so I'll be very brief on the annual audit letter. This, the annual audit letter summarises the conclusions of the audit after we've finally signed off. As members will recall from meetings uh, last year, uh, it was a, quite a protracted process. The, um, the statutory deadlines were extended, but in Hartlepool's case, we didn't achieve the, um, the sign-off deadline. And that was because of a delay in the receipt of the pension fund auditor assurance from the auditor of uh, Teesside Pension Fund. We, we did get a response from them before um, the end of November, but it raised issues which couldn't be resolved until 
early December. So the sign off date was the 7th of December, just after uh, the, the revised deadline of the 30th of November. Uh, the positive thing, though, is we were able to issue an unqualified audit opinion. So um, a statement that the financial statements of the council give a true and fair view of the council's financial position uh, at the end of March 2020 and of its income and expenditure for that year. And that also the financial statements have been prepared in accordance with the SIPFA Code of Practice on Local Authority Accounting. So an unqualified opinion and also an unqualified value for money conclusion. Some members will be aware that we look at uh, the council's arrangements to secure economy efficiency and effectiveness. And we did that for the year ended 31st of March 2020. And again, an unqualified value for money conclusion. So a positive outcome to the audit, albeit uh, taking longer than it normally would um, to complete. The only other thing I wanted well, those two other things I wanted to briefly mention. Um, the first one um, is our audit fees. Some members will see from our annual audit letter that as we trailed during the audit last year, there was an increase in audit fees uh, for 2019-20. They're reflected in the letter and they've been agreed with Chris Little, Chris Little the Chief Financial Officer. I do point out that there are a fairly significant increase in fees uh, but it's not unique to Hartlepool. That's sort of in common with all audits. There's been a significant increase in audit fees this year. And the final thing that I wanted to mention, which is quite difficult really, is the forward look. I think everybody's sort of finding it difficult to take a forward look at the moment. There's um, the challenges of, of COVID, which inevitably impact on the council and, and its communities. Um, there's the financial outlook, which is also a very difficult one to assess, um, as the council uh, doesn't have a sort of clarity on medium term funding. It's sort of having to work on a year by year basis. And there are clearly additional pressures and challenges on the council from COVID and other things. Uh, so it is quite difficult to, to see how things are going to develop over the future. But we're confident that the council um, has good arrangements in place um, and that officers will manage manage the way through those difficulties as we go forward and we'll track things as they do that. And just one thing to very briefly highlight um, in relation to the forthcoming audit, the audit of the 2020-21 financial year, is that there is a change in the code of audit practice uh, particularly around the way that we assess value for money arrangements. And we'll pick that up uh, in more detail when we issue, issue our audit plan, our audit strategy memorandum um, in a couple of months' time. Uh, but it's just to sort of highlight that there are some some changes in that this year. Uh, and that that is um, all I really wanted to mention. I'm quite happy to sort of take any questions or listen to any comments that members might have, but I've just really pleased that we finally concluded the 2019-20 audit. Thank you very much, uh, Gavin. Um, a couple of years ago, we had the um, Northampton Sea uh, County Council measures, measures, I think, at the moment. Um, I haven't got the full details, but uh, maybe from yourself and Chris, about the outlay of, of, of that investigation. I mean, I know we've got excellent officers in the finance offices in Hartlepool at the moment. Um, in Northamptonshire, was it a breakdown from councillors or officers or one of the items of that? Or can you comment that? Or Because I know we've got all the information to the audit and governance from Chris Litter and Noel Allenson, um, but was, was it a breakdown from officers and Officers and councillors. Um, Chair, I, I think it would be probably inappropriate of me to comment on Northampton because I mean I don't know the detail of the arrangements. They have their own auditors. Uh, there's obviously been a lot uh, published in the press about it, but I'm not really in a position to to comment on their arrangements. What what I can comment on is yours, and I think um, um, 
the key thing for me is um, the finances of the council are very carefully and prudently managed and um, there are difficult decisions to be taken and that may sort of lead to sort of difficult conversations between officers and members, maybe when setting the council tax and things like that. You know, there's, there, there are difficult decisions to be made, but um, I'm not highlighting any concerns with, with your arrangements from based on the work that we undertake. Uh, and if we did have concerns, we would raise them because we do that in other places when, when the need arises and it just, it just that isn't the case at Hartlepool. So hopefully you'll take some assurance for that, but it's not really appropriate for me to comment on uh, the Northampton case. Very heavy assurance at the moment. Brenda Lines, please. Sorry, is my hand up? Sorry, I mistake. Sorry, uh, Chair. Right. Um, any comments? Tony, Councillor Richardson. If we'd hand up. Oh. Yeah, I'd just like to ask the question on um, page five on our fees. Uh, the additional procedure of consideration of the potential impact on the proposed remedy of the McLeod case and also the Goodwin case. I don't understand that. Um, well, they're, they're, um, they're, they're quite detailed technical issues. Um, and the detail of that was reflected in our previous reports to you, which were uh, the, the audit completion report. But the um, the McLeod case um, was a pension case that led to additional liabilities for the council. And the Goodwin case was a, a case that arose this summer, which had a potential impact on the council. And um, due to um, the government indicating the, the actuary, when they prepared um, the figures that were reflected in your financial statement, uh, made assumptions about what the potential liabilities might be. But after your accounts were produced in the summer, in July, uh, the government proposed what remedy would actually be put in place. And actuaries then had to go back and see whether the assumptions they'd made uh, were in line with the proposed remedy, um, which is what that's referring to there. Uh, so there's some additional area now to look at the uh, remedy we put in place and see whether it was in line with the proposed remedy from government. Uh, and in your case, it was, and there were no amendments required to your financial statements, but we still have to do additional work in relation to that. The Goodwin case was one where you do have some additional liabilities. Uh, it was very difficult at the time to estimate accurately what they were, but your actuary provided information to demonstrate that they wouldn't have a material impact on the financial statements, which is again something that we have to look at and consider. So that that explains the, the additional work and the additional fee for that work, which is reflected uh, in the, um, the page of the audit letter that you've referenced. Yeah, Could, would I be able to get a copy of that? The paperwork on that. The paperwork on on the Goodwin case and the, the McLeod case. There must be paperwork there, surely. Well, that's probably something that you could ask your officers for. Certainly, there's a, mo there's a more detailed explanation in our audit completion report, which was uh, which will be in the agenda papers of the, the previous meetings. OK, cheers. Thanks for that. Thank um, thanks, um, Tony. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, uh, Gavin. Um, very reassuring, and um, we've got a, a full um, audit uh, report. Thanks, so, thanks uh, Jeff. Thanks. thanks. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, 4.2 internal audit plan 2021 update. Be null. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, the report uh, that I'm presenting today is in its normal format uh, that we bring to committee. Um, table one that outlines the recommendations that we've made at schools. Um, I'm pleased to, to report to members that they've all been um, accepted uh, and implemented. Table two on page four that outlines uh, the completed audits um, that we've been able um, to do over the, over the course of time since we've last reported and also the, the assurance levels. Uh, that we've placed 
on those individual pieces of work and I'm pleased to report uh, that we have no limited assurance audits or no assurance audits uh, to report to committee. Um, in paragraph 3.6 to 3.8, Chair, what I've, I've tried to do is just give uh, the committee a, a little bit of information about how the section's been uh, trying to support the council's COVID response. Obviously, Craig's just described in some, some detail that the serious situation that we that we find ourselves in. Um, a lot of what we've been doing is, is been behind the scenes around making sure that grant payments uh, to businesses are processed uh, correctly and and as, as quickly as we can, uh, making sure we carry out checks on the businesses that are applying to make sure um, they're still obviously ongoing businesses and le legitimate and, and they due to, the, to that support that the government's offered. And there's the support across a number of, of different categories now, and um, we're pretty much sort of processing those payments every day um, as and when, when they come through. Um, we're doing quite a bit of data testing to make sure, we're, as I say, all those those payments are valid um, as far as we can as far as we can see. Um, also, our staff um, have been seconded uh, for a day a week to help uh, the local track and, and trace system as well, and, and are currently being trained up um, to do that. Uh, so hopefully, as I say, in a, in a very serious situation we find ourselves in, they'll be able to provide support. Uh, around the track and trade system as well. So that's uh, we felt um, that as auditors, that they had the skills uh, that would lend themselves to, to providing support in that area. They're quite dogged, you know, they, they're quite used to contacting people and, and they've got good communication skills. So hopefully we'll be able to help in, uh, in boosting that area as well. Um, table four of the report chair that details the audits that are ongoing at the moment um, and as normal appendix A that, that goes into a little bit more detail about the individual recommended actions that we've agreed and, and risks um, that were highlighted when we, we carried out the audit work. Um, so basically chair that's all I, I really wanted to say quite happy to, to try and answer any questions that members might have or listen to any comments that, that members may want to make and the recommendation of the report um, is that members know the contents therein. Thank you, uh, Noel. Um, ben Harrison? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I think Noel just highlights something which we need to acknowledge um, as a committee, and that's the fact that um, people have been seconded throughout the Council to do various different tasks. So when they are used to going into doing their normal job, as it were, um, they find themselves in a completely different situation. So I, I just think that needs acknowledging, and um, and thanks to Noel for for actually highlighting that and making us aware of it. Thank you. Uh, I always ask for any, any meeting about um, the audit stuff in um, you know the, the department, uh, Noel, at the moment. Obviously, we um, will we'll, we'll work at the moment, and um, a lot of um, encumbrances at the moment. Um, what's the stuff morale or whatever, or what numbers in the in your department? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Thanks for that, chair. We, you, the committee members always um, mention and ask about the stuff, and it's something we really appreciate. Um, I'm very lucky. I've I've got an excellent team um, of auditors. They're all at work. Um, it's it's funny, really. Um, as the as members of the committee will be aware, we've we've we home workers, we've worked from home a number of years, so in relation to how we carry out our tasks, our roles, that hasn't changed a great deal. Um, but obviously what has had an impact is the different circumstances that some of our staff members find themselves in, whether they have to isolate themselves or whether they have to shield, whether they've got young families, obviously with children at home now, that they've got to provide a bit of um, care and assistance to with the homeschooling. Um, so the, there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot of factors outside our control that we, we're trying to manage. Um, but having said all that, I have an excellent team. I, I, I'll tell anybody I'm, I'm very fortunate in, in that respect. Uh, the team are very committed. Um, they're highly professional in what they do. I'm lucky that I've got a stable team as well. Uh, we haven't had a great uh, deal of turnover in terms of staff over a good few years now. So that sort of gives me assurance that they, they're sort of reasonably happy in, in, in what they do. Um, so yeah, I, I think 
Uh, we're quite stable. We try and to provide support when we can. And, and, and the, the sort of, we've got to balance that obviously against uh, giving the, the committee an opinion, you know, at, at the end of the year, um, statutory requirement that we have to provide. So it, we're just trying to get that balance right at the moment, still being able to provide the committee with what we've we've got to do around the opinion on our governance arrangements here at the council, um, but also provide support to the council's COVID response, you know, as I, as I previously mentioned, which, which is at a very serious um point in time at, at the moment so yeah we, we we i think we're coping quite well and obviously the council has set up a number of initiatives um around staff support if if needed you know around mental health and um is given guidance and you know obviously we have all the sort of the one-to-ones and regular meetings and catch-ups um and, and such as that chair so i'm um, sitting here I, things are changing so quickly before christmas our, our Maybe it's naively thought um, we would move next in the next year's order plan and, and be something more close to what we used to. But sitting here today, I'm wondering, well, is it going to be more COVID related, um, given where we're at? Uh, I suppose, you know, from picking up on from what Craig was saying, a, a, a lot will depend on the vaccine. Um, but no, we appreciate, you, you know, the thought that the members ask how we're doing and, and, and we're doing fine. And we, we, we try and do as much as we can to support the council at the moment, Chair. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chair Noel. Um, Marjorie? Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to ask maybe the naughty question, really. Um, paragraph 3.6 in the report, uh, will we be updating that it, now that we know the outcome of the double-headed uh, election in Georgia? 3.6. Mm. Two point six. Uh, um, the the election in Georgia, chair. Um, well, in in paragraph three point six, you, yeah, it's indicated that uh, the Republicans will retain their slim majority in the Senate. Well, they didn't. Uh, so I'm assuming that that may change things. Chair, I think this is item um four point three, the Treasury Management Strategy. Yeah. Which is oh, the next right. report, which is the one All right, here. sorry. Oh, well, I'm getting in early then. So, so you can ask me that yeah. question. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to know what the update is on that paragraph when we get to it then. I better have a think about yeah, that. Yeah, we'll, we'll come to that, Marjorie. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Noah, for your uh, report. And um, we've noted the uh, comment. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks very much. Now then, 4.3, Treasury Management Strategy. Is that from Chris or? Uh, it, it's me, Chair. Uh, Chris is obviously oh, yeah, very busy at sorry. the moment. Um, Deputy for Chris. Yeah, he's doing the budget for Hartlepool and indeed the fire authority, so he's asked me to present this report. Thanks, thank um, you very much. So this is the annual Treasury Management Report the Committee. Um, the report covers three elements. Uh, firstly, a backward review of 1920. Uh, secondly, a review of the current position for 2021. And finally, the Treasury, Treasury Management Strategy for 21-22. And this strategy will then be referred to full council for approval. I think by its nature, the report is obviously quite complex in places. Uh, however, the overriding message is one of caution and prudence. Um, and this has very much been the case over the past year or so, given the uncertainty around firstly Brexit, which is now mainly resolved, but obviously the COVID pande pandemic and obviously what's going on in the US here as well as is further uncertainty at the moment. Um, and I'm not sure how that has been resolved yet. Um, I don't propose to go, report, go through the report in full detail, but if I pick out the main points, and firstly, turning to the 1920 position, this is set out at section four. Um, as members would expect, the council has complied with all the potential indicators, and these are further set out in the appendices. The year in position is detailed in paragraph 4.15, which shows that we had 78.5 million of long-term debt, an interest rate of 3.67%, which is a lower rate. And also we had 12.8 million of investment income out. You will note that on the investment income, there has been quite a decrease in the rate of return, the average rate. And this reflects the market conditions, um, certainly the back end of last year as COVID took over and obviously the Brexit situation. 
and that low rate has continued into the into the new year. The in-year position for 2021 is set out at section five, and members will know that there's very little change. Um, the increase in investment income really relates to the cash flow position as, as at the time at the end of September. Finally, the Treasury Management Strategy for 21-22 is set out at section six to section eight, with the potential indicators at Appendix B. Um, on borrowing, the strategy focuses on minimising borrowing, therefore minimising costs and the impact on revenue budget, as members would expect. And the investment strategy is focused on normal Treasury Management cash flow requirements, so really putting security uh, first and foremost, then liquidity, and then investment returns. So basically minimising the risk to council funds. The recommendations themselves are set out to section uh, 19. Members, but otherwise, I'm happy to take any questions that may arise. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, James. Um, Marjorie, you want to comment on the um, election, elect USA uh, elections? Uh, yes, please, Chair. I mean, uh, I think we've all been watching what's been happening in the United States. Um, quite deplorable, really, what happened yesterday in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh, but my understanding is that those two Senate seats in Georgia were not Republican outcome, and therefore the balance in the Senate uh, will be different. Uh, and I understand that the incoming vice president will actually have a casting vote uh, because the Senate will be 50-50. Um, so watching it with interest, um, it obviously may make a difference because what's being said very clearly by the Democratic side of the political process is that they do want a stimulus package and that they do want to sort of support working class families and those that are struggling financially uh, because obviously some have lost their jobs and some are at the moment not earning the, at the level that they would normally. So hopefully if, if we do get an upturn in the United States, um, then that may have a knock-on effect to companies here that do work with and provide contract work for companies in the United States, uh, some of which are actually here in Hartlepool. So I think uh, we should be watching what's happening in the United States with some interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I mean, recently there was the, the case where um, they were trying to do a stimulus package for COVID support. Uh, and it was, there was a debate between either £600 or £2,000 per citizen. And I think the £2,000 was being blocked by some of the Republican senators. So clearly, in those circumstances, the highest stimulus packages should be able to get through. So in that sense, that could be a positive for the economy. Yeah, well, it's being said that that'll happen on the 20th. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Marjorie. Um, James, a couple of comments about um, the Treasury management. Um, I think the Chancellor of Exchequer, somebody said to me, um, he's throwing confetti in the poor population of um, England with billions to um, workers and companies or whatever. One of the snaggers that the low interest is very, very low. Um, what happens in the future if the interest rise rising? Yeah, so from a national policy uh, situation, if the interest rate starts rising in the future, clearly that will have an impact on government's um, ability to support the economy and to support the public sector. So an increase in uh, interest rates in the future will potentially impact on the, you know, at our level in terms of the, the likely funds coming through the councils. So. It is certainly something to watch out for. From the council's point of view, because we've got quite low borrowing anyway, and we haven't got a significant future borrowing requirement, I don't think we're exposed to significant risks on that side. We clearly, as the situation develops and as our, the budget goes over the next few years, that might become an issue if we have, say, a, a more significant capital programme. So at the moment, I don't think the council is significantly exposed or at risk, but clearly it is something to look out for, certainly at a national level. Mm -hmm. and on number eight, on um, page 19, about the uh, upper limits from um, 
borrowing. Um, can we extend or reduce the borrowing in previous future years or whatever? So the council's borrowing is, is really um, is a consequence of the capital programme. So you borrow for your capital programme and that might be um, major schemes such as the new life centre or it could be minor schemes such as uh, replacement of bin wagons, uh, road maintenance, repairs and maintenance and the like. So our ability to adjust how much we borrow really is a consequence of what we decide to do as a council on the capital schemes. If we decided not to have a capital programme, that would reduce the borrowing. If we decided to have a, a more significant capital programme, that would increase the borrowing. The key aspect really is that if the borrowing is affordable. That's the key determinant. So can we afford that borrowing? And that's basically what the prudential indicators are there to demonstrate that we can uh, afford the borrowing. I, I do think, um, I think when I look through the report in Appendix A, the ratio of finance and costs to revenue stream, the, the first potential indicator, 3.3%. Um, um, my initial reaction to that was that's very good. That's a, that's you know that's a low percentage, certainly a low percentage that I'm used to. So that is a positive in terms of the impact on the revenue budget. Yeah, a lot of residents said to me that um, I have no money and that get the Dunley um, Church Street improvements or whatever. And they can't realise the difference between revenue and capital. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So with with capital is just the borrowing cost to hit the um, revenue budget. But equally, a lot of the capital investment is to generate investment in this in the town. You know, to increase the business rate. So it does have a knock on effect elsewhere. So there is a, a business case around some of the big decisions. Mm. Thank you much indeed. Um, any other comments? Um, no. So thanks for your report, uh, James, and um, thank you. Um, 4.4, business continuity. Is that uh, Sylvia? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, this report is to provide members with an update on the uh, business, uh, the Council's business continuity arrangements and follows on from a, a previous report that was presented to this committee in December 2019. Um, in the 2019 report, um, we did state that we would um, look at providing a number or carrying out a number of exercises um, in relation to um, testing our business continuity plans. However, unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, it's not been possible to proceed with the exercises um, that were um, planned. Um, however, the COVID pandemic um, did result in uh, the Council having to respond rapidly um, to um, changing circumstances and to ensure that we were able to uh, have been able to operate throughout and that work has been carried out uh, that have been carried out in relation to business continuity has provided to be um, invaluable in relation to um, our response to this un unprecedented uh, circumstances that we currently find ourselves in. The Business Continuity Group um, has looked um, at um, our um, initial responses and identified a number of areas where we need to update our business continuity plans. Um, in particular, um, the fact that we've got staff that are currently working from home and are not office-based anymore. There have been um, many changes to the ways that we're actually uh, operating at this time, and those need to be reflected in our current um, business continuity arrangements. And work is uh, currently ongoing to identify the areas where we need to uh, uh, update and amend the plans and to revise um, those parts accordingly. In addition to that, uh, we're also discussing uh, with our partners in the local resilience forum and taking on board any um, um, details of challenges that they face that we can um, also incorporate in our current plans. Um, it's um, sorry, I've locked my computer is locked up. Um, the um, the council is is looking at re revising its obviously its business continuity. Um, plan, um, as I've said, um, and um, we were uh, currently working towards that. Um, and it's rec the recommendation is that members um, note the work that's been done um, uh, currently uh, to provide um, business, uh, robust business continuity arrangements within the council. Thank you. Thank you. So any comments from members? 
Hello, so the ongoing um, procedure from the uh, robust um, framework. John? Uh, just a, a, a quick question, um, some clarification whether the committee would like any further update reports going forward in relation to business continuity. I think particularly in the COVID situation, I think we need more information really or reassurance from um, officers at the moment. Yeah. Marjorie? Thank you, Chair. The, um, I have asked this previously, but I'll ask it again. Um, there, are, there are parts of our local economy that are again in lockdown and therefore closed. And it would be very helpful if we could look at implementing an introduction of similar to the hygiene arrangements where restaurants and cafes, etc., food establishments have the five star arrangements so that uh, the public are quite aware of what they should expect from as a quality issue uh, from those kind of establishments. But there are other parts of the local economy, and I think the one that I picked on last time, and I'll do it again, is the hairdressing arrangements. And hairdressing and barbers shops across Hartlepool are many and varied. Uh, and it would be helpful if we could work with the sector to bring in a similar arrangement of the one to five stars. Now, I accept that at the moment there may not be a capacity, well, there may be a capacity issue within the workforce to be able to carry that out. But I'm aware, because I know a number of hairdressers in the town, um, that they would be more than willing to participate in that uh, and to look at COVID security and hygiene arrangements going forward. Um, because, you know, some of these smaller businesses are going to disappear through no fault of their own because of the financial impact of COVID. So as we are now moving into a world where COVID is not going to disappear, regardless of whether we have an immunisation or not, it's going to be with us for a very long time, if not forever. And other things are already on the boil somewhere else in the world that could very well put us back in this situation very soon. So there is absolutely no way of knowing that. So I think that the more economic sectors that we can protect by having those kind of uh, assessment arrangements in place, it would be very helpful to the local economy. And uh, if we can bring that kind of thing in so that a decision could be made. And I mean, roughly rule of thumb chair, what I'm looking at is that if, if we have a one to five stars, if you're a five star, four star arrangement, then uh, within reason, you should be able to continue to trade uh, because you've proven that your practices are good and that people are safe within your establishment. If you're a three, you should be given a, a period of time to come up to a four, and additional work obviously needs to be done if you're only a one or a two. Um, but we're going to have to have these hard cut-off lines, and therefore we need processes in place that enable sectors of our community businesses to actually continue to trade, even if we are in a pandemic, uh, on the understanding that they can prove, and that's where the, uh, the qualification bit would come in, uh, they, they can prove that their practices are good or better than good. Thank you. I agree with some of your sentiments, uh, Marjorie. I think particularly in the hosp hospitality sector as well, you know, there's money and effort to get uh, COVID secure, and yet health experts say uh, it's in houses and buildings rather than shops and cafes or whatever. So more secure in a uh, COVID cafe or pub rather than the house even. So it's, it's an anomaly really. John? Yeah, um, so just to, to, to tie those um, issues off. Um, what I'll um, do, Chair, if, the, if it's okay with the committee, is if we can, um, in consultation with yourself, look at a um, timescale period for future reports in relation to business continuity. Um, but in addition to that, I know that we did raise the issue that Marjorie highlighted um, around hairdressers. I will chase up to see um, whether there's been any progress on that and raise the issues, the other issues identified by 
by Marjorie outside the meeting and send an update round by my email. Yeah. If that's okay. Can, can I just comment, Chair, because whilst we, hairdressing is the main one, but obviously barbers would be just exactly the same. They're one sector. Uh, so let's not be um, disingenuous to those uh, male members of the public that go elsewhere. No problem, Chair. Right, uh, we move on to standard um, items 5.1. Revised co code of conduct for elected members and co opted members and best practice recommendations. Here we go, um, Officer. Morning, members. Thank you, Chair. Oh, hey, um, yeah, it's me today. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. I'm here. Um, members may recall that in 2019, the Committee for Standards in Public Life and their report, Local Government Ethical Standards, they set out 26 recommendations to improve ethical standards in local government. Many of the recommendations were aimed at central government and will require legislative change. For example, a proposal to um, increase the sanctions available for breach of the Code of Conduct. Um, that would require legislative change um, and there are a number of other issues um, but one of the recommendations from the report was aimed at the local government association and recommended that they produce an update updated model code of conduct for adoption by councils um, following extensive consultation the LGA have now produced this model and a copy is set out at appendix A of the report. The code is voluntary and can be adapted to meet um, local needs. Um, the ethical standards report also contained 15 best practice recommendations which are being monitored for compliance by the Cabinet Office. The report also sets out um, progress that we've made in relation to each of the recommendations, some of which have been addressed by the Model Code of Conduct. Um, the recommendations are set out in Section 4 of the report and members' comments and views are invited so that these can be fed through to the Constitution Committee um, and on to full council for adoption. Thank you. Thank you. I mean... Most of the um, rules and principles, seven items of rules and principles, is um, replicated in the um, Code of Conduct, I think. Um, Marjorie? No. Okay, thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to comment, really, and to just have some clarification. The, um, the report at to, well, the, the Appendix A at 10.2, uh, that we would register up to a, a, a gift, if we've accepted a gift from someone of at least £50. Is that not currently £25? Uh, and from a personal point of view, um, I think it should remain at £25 uh, because, you know, members in the public services must not do things that show that they could be open to a biased decision based on having received anything of a nom it used to just say nominal value and when you asked for clarification as to what nominal value was it it was 25 pounds i'm sure it was uh, i mean i'm also quite happy um that uh, we should at last have something around bullying and harassment of staff by elected members uh, because we obviously already have a bullying and harassment programme within uh, staff to staff. Uh, but at the moment, as far as I was aware, and it was me that actually moved that in council a while ago, was that uh, if you are an elected member, and it's, that's an additional problem, because unless there is a means of removing you as the perpetrator uh, from a staff arrangement, then the victim will always be the victim uh, because, you know, as a councillor, you could go and stand at the corner of the desk of any member of staff at any time, which means that if you have stepped over the line, then you will continue to do so. So the victim would just remain a victim until such time as they left, which is uh, unacceptable. So there has to be some teeth within these arrangements. You know, we, we've had the Nolan principles, we've had the standards committees, and uh, they were worse than rubbish, really, uh, because they didn't have any teeth. 
we should have the right to remove from public office any elected official or representative if they are proven to have broken what are the, what is the law if we were a paid member of staff. Um, it's just unacceptable that an elected member should be able to deal with that. Whether they're an MP or a, a councillor is irrelevant to me. They are an elected re representative and they should not have any more rights than a member of staff. Uh, and if they err from the line that they should be on, then they should be removed from office. Thank you. Thanks, Marjorie. Um, Brenda Harrison? Yeah, I just want to totally agree with everything Marjorie's just said. Um, I think it's uh, an appalling situation to have people in office who have been elected who can't behave in the way that um, they should be behaving. Um, so I really do um, totally agree with what with what Marjorie said. I still don't think the teeth are there strong enough, um, but let's hope they get stronger. Okay. Um. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to, um, on the point that Councillor James raised on the um, gifts and hospitality, I think at the moment I was just say £25, so I'd be happy to just, um, if members prefer to keep it um, at that, level. Um, um, Councillor James is right as well, the um, the bullying and harassment wasn't previously set out in our code of conduct, so um, the referral from council um, in relation to the motion proposed by Councillor James now thankfully has been addressed by the model code. Um, and in terms of teeth, um, we're, still, we're still waiting, but hopefully this is like at least one step forward. Um, and legislation will change to to bring back in um, those stronger sanctions in relation to breaches. Thanks, Thank Mary. you. Um, Claire? You're on mute, Claire. Mute. Sorry, there's too much to do on, the, on these things. Um, yeah, it's not strictly about the code of conduct, but it is related. And I thought, well, Haley's still here, I'll ask her. Um, I noted in previous minutes that um, there have been a bit about independent persons. And as, as I'm retiring, um, I wanted to know where we are with that, because it said if nobody had um, applied, you might borrow one from a, another council, although this was not ideal. Well, I think it's more than not ideal. I think really um, every effort should be made to re-advertise or do an article in the mail or something because we do need um, independent people from the town I think. It's quite varied all the things I've I've had to do. I mean at one point you put me up to chair a meeting and I was grilled by the public and the, it was the fact that I came from the town you know which sort of swung their acceptance in a way. Um, so really, I'm just sort of asking where we are with that. Thank you. Yeah, um, we we have advertised. We advertised before Christmas. Um, we I think there's still another week or so until the closing date, um, and we've sent out a number of packs. I'm not sure in relation to how many we've had returned yet, but um, we we that that is something that we would do i think we would look to if we didn't get anyone we would re-advertise because we appreciate the um it's currently all on you at the moment claire um so we'll we'll continue to monitor that oh thank you no, no volunteers can we conscript with them <laughs> I, I think a lot of people don't realize the efforts and work independent persons or whatever, and uh, they're reluctant to pull a certain forward. That's the problem, I think. Um, but we have to get some. Okay. Thanks, so. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. Um, 6.1, that's scrutiny. Um, Complaints, advocacy, service update. Yes, Chair, yeah, there's a, a very brief over um, introducing report there. Um, it's just to say that we obviously on a regular basis welcome um, feedback from the Complaints Advocacy Service to, to uh, give us an update um, in relation to the types of 
complaints that they received. Um, we, we, we have uh, progressed to an annual um, report at the present moment in time and I'm very pleased to say that Philip Kerr is here today uh, to provide us with that update uh, and a copy of the report is appended to my covering report that was circulated with the papers. If I at this point chair could hand over to Philip um, and I'm sure he'd be uh, happy to go through his report and answer any questions that members might have. Um, thanks for Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair, and thanks for the opportunity to give the annual update of the NHS Complaints Advocacy Service. Um, a very interesting year, if I can use those words. Um, our service, the effect COVID has had on the uh, complaint service was uh, quite dramatic in that the Parliamentary Health Service Ombudsman and NHS England uh, put an amendment through the Department of Health and Social Care to uh, stop any complaints work from uh, March to the end of June, which, as you probably will understand, that's like having the rug pulled from under you without any notice. Um, we reacted to that by taking advantage of the government's furlough scheme. Basically, our advocates' caseloads were then significantly reduced from where we'd expect them to be. Um, that was lifted on the 30th of June and we phased everybody back to the 31st of October. But um, as you're probably aware, we're now in another lockdown, so that will that will affect our delivery. Um, the demand in, in Hartlepool fell. That's what we've experienced across the region anyway. Um, roughly 50% of where we would expect to be. The figures are in the report, so I'm not going to dwell on those. But it was interesting that we've we've had some um, presentation today which shows where the areas where you've got problems with infections. It's interesting that who's complaining in Hartlepool, I would draw your attention to the two postcodes where most of our complaints come from, that's TS25 and 26. Whether that correlates with anything that you have got of local knowledge, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, complaints this year, when I've given annual updates before, I've always I've sort of given some background. Uh, it's roughly 66% female complainants, 33% um, obviously to, to male. That's a little bit of a change over the last couple of years. I mean, I remember two years ago telling the committee it was mostly male complainants, so uh, the ladies are having their turn. Um, and about approximately half of our inquiries individuals have some sort of health issue. So I'm quite happy with that because we are getting to the people that have health issues, um, which, which is important for us to do. I've provided in the report a breakdown of the bodies that the complaints were against. Um, uh, GP practices that is listed on the, on the second page. Um, there, I can't tell you the practices because you have to keep the anonymity, but I'm allowed to sort of share the the issues uh, that the complaints are about. Obviously, North Tees and Hartlepool Trust features, uh, and will always feature because that's they have the majority of the um, health concerns to deal with in secondary care. And I've listed in there some of the some of the areas. The good thing is, in Hartlepool, we've had not had one. COVID-related complaints. Now, that's not our experience across the region, um, where we've had some quite serious COVID complaints, uh, COVID-based complaints. So, so that's whether that is a positive, I'm not sure, because um, complaints have up to 12 months to be registered from the date of the event. So it, it could be after this lockdown, however long this one lasts, we may be seeing some, some complaints then. But um, referral breakdowns, again, is listed there. Um, we've still got uh, excellent relationships locally with Healthwatch anyway, uh, and PALS have uh, referred um, quite a few to us, even though the numbers are, are quite small, smaller than I would expect. Um, but this only, represents the, this only represents where we're helping people and people are coming direct to us. Um, they can go direct to their NHS organisation anyway. And, and deal with the complaint there. Um, 
outcomes was something that um, um, councillors had asked me uh, previously and said, yeah, it's great having complaints, but what sort of outcomes are you getting? Um, and I've listed those briefly. Um, there's a, there's, if you can see on the third page, I think that is the first ombudsman case. It says there's, there was a complaint was upheld for a Hartlepool complainant. What I can say is the measures uh, in place against a hospital trust are a different hospital trust. They were a Hartlepool resident, but they'd access services south of the river. So it's not, uh, so that's some confidence. It's not, wasn't against the, the local hospital trust. Um, but what we have seen this year is, and I've listed there is a number of clients who have withdrawn from the process and stated COVID as the reason they're withdrawing because they believe that they wouldn't get the answer and it's taking resource away from the NHS for dealing with their complaints. So they've been prepared to say, well, I think I'll leave it. If, if I need to come back, um, I'll come back. Um, and as, as every other organisation, we've had to adapt to virtual ways of working. It's actually worked pretty well for us. We, we virtually meet with all of our external partners um, and, and that's great. We, we, work, uh, we meet monthly with the North Tees and Hartlepool uh, Patient Carers uh, Committee. So I'm able to put across the, the complaints experience in Hartlepool to the trust. So we have excellent relationships with them. And we're continuing a lot of work with the deaf community currently because they're being challenged with um, life in general. I mean, the, the communication around coronavirus, but also they've had some really big issues with interpretation services and, and, and trying to access um, support. And we do work with Hartlepool Deaf Centre. Um, we, we, did, we did some publicity through um, North Tees, um, NHS Tees Valley CCD, obviously, um, to get some information out to primary care contractors just to to say we're still there we're still around and we'll support you so in summary <laughs> quickly um it's been an interesting and challenging year we've learned a lot of lessons about how to deliver nhs complaints advocacy in a different way we're really surprised at the number of people that are able to engage with us virtually uh with clients that is so that's that's something that's new and something we will be looking at. But for years, um, we've worked at home anyway. So remote working wasn't anything um, that was a challenge to us. Uh, the challenge was to move our helpline service to, to home uh, and the confidentiality issues that were around that. But we've, we've resolved all of those things. Uh, the other thing is that um, the Ombudsman throughout the pandemic has been working on some new complaints uh, standards and those are going to be piloted in the northeast region from March onwards. Um, I don't have details of who the pilot sites are going to be, but I'm hopeful that we'll have one that's in the south of the region. <clears throat> and the idea is to make the complaints process more accessible, um, easier to, to, to work through. And because the, we, we support lots of people and our experience is it's taking far too long for people to get answers. So the Ombudsman have recognised that uh, and that will be embedded in a framework after it's piloted, probably now in 2022, but I'm probably being over optimistic. Um, but it's, it's like everywhere, we've adapted. Um, I am concerned that that we're not getting the level of inquiries from Hartlepool, but I have to say I'm not I'm not concerned in that everybody has other things to look at. It's vaccinations, it's controlling the um, controlling the virus, it's complying with all of that. But what I am confident on is we are still getting to the most vulnerable people that need us in Hartlepool, and that's with our partnerships that we have established. Uh, and they refer to us anyway. So, I mean, that's my sort of whistle-stop tour of what is um, a quite detailed piece of work, and, and you've got it there, and I'm quite, quite willing to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, 
I wonder if a lot of people have come to Health Watch rather than the complaints. How he is with Health Watch all the time. Are they, um... I can I can answer that in that we we keep in regular contact with Health Watch. We've done some virtual um, uh, meetings with them. Um, Health Watch staff were furloughed for uh, a period and uh, of time similar to to us. And and I think they are still going there. And we we have had referrals when the team have come back in. But that's probably better for Health Watch to answer what their experience is because their remit is wider than ours. Ours is really focused on complaints, but theirs is right across the health and social care issues. And and I know that they're having lots of dialogue around, you know, what what's currently happening, what supports there for people. So, <clears throat> so that's also, probably good. also um, I'm looking at the um, postal lottery. Yeah. TS 25 and 26. I think um, TS24. My mother used to say, um, let's see, yeah, on the, uh, on the <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, um, just, just obviously we can, we do come the same work in every postcode area. Um, but having said that, some of our inquiries, they don't necessarily take our support with an advocate, but they do take all our literature um, to do the complaint themselves. So, I mean, 30% of our work is is to get people to be empowered and do it themselves uh, so that we can deal with the most uh, vulnerable. So, Councillor Harrison. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Philip, for that. Um, just a couple of quick questions, really. What's PALS? <laughs> All right. Um, I, I, I just couldn't... I, I, I probably missed it somewhere, but no, no, that that's completely understandable. That's the that's the in-house uh, service. It's in hospitals. It's the patient's advice and liaison service. Ah, right. So right, if you right. have an issue in hospital, that's where you would go first of all. Right. Well, funnily enough, the second question I have is kind of linked to that. Um, do you get to know? I mean, you've just you've just been asked by Jed about Health Watch. Do you yeah. get to know of any complaints that go directly to the hospital? So, or, or do you just get to know the complaints that come to you? So there could be quite a number of complaints, is what I'm saying, that go directly to the hospital or the GP or wherever, um, rather than come to you. Do you ever get to know about those? Um, yes, we do. Um, right. I mentioned I mentioned briefly that we're on the... Uh, North East Trust uh, Patient Care um, Committee, and within that, um, we do a quarterly review of complaints. So we're involved independently, and it's on, all anonymised. So yeah, all the stats are there. Now, what I can say, without labouring the point, from an advocacy point of view, we've we traditionally support probably about 20%. 22% of complaints that go through the trust from Hartlepool, so basis. So a lot do go direct and get resolved fairly quickly. Yeah. We tend to be involved in the ones that are a bit more depth. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's okay. So I think it's a short report. We'll do what um, we're behind that. So um, the presentation for the committee is uh, very welcome. Come out at as well, so anything we can do. Thank you. Go on. Yeah, Chair, just um, one question. Would the, the uh, committee like to receive some further information around the pilots for the new standards framework as and when we're, we're aware of where they are and what it's going to look like? Um, I can work with Philip to get something brought forward as and when we're in a position to do that. Yeah, definitely. That's a good idea, John. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Philip, um, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. So, nine, two, six point three. Yeah, that, I'll take that one, oh, Chair. Time to speak. Imagine a hearty pull. Yeah, I can. I can take that one. Um. Members will recall before Christmas we had a consultation from NHS England and Improvement 
um, about the future of orthodontic provision in Hartlepool. Um, the committee um, agreed with option two and that, that was subsequently sent back to them as part of their engagement. Um, but during the discussions, there was a number of concerns raised by members and uh, representatives from NHS England and Improvement were hoping to, to join the meeting today um, and they were looking to send a presentation through uh, this week. But obviously with the, the changes in the situation with COVID and I think they're getting roped into um, supporting the vaccination programme that they were unable to actually join the meeting. Um, they did send a paper through yesterday afternoon, which I did forward to members by email. Um, it's uh, just over three pages long and it, um, it outlines the current provision that's available in the town and um, details the practices and addresses of the practices of dental practices and then goes on to list the orthodontic service provision in the town as well, which I know members were, were keen to, to find out about. It goes into more detail about how they've prioritised patients throughout the pandemic. Um, and then there's some slight changes being made to that provision since the announcement on Monday. Um, but that's all detailed in the paper. And then it goes on to the end to say that, um, that they're looking to increase the orthodontic provision in the town further. Um, as a result of the procurement process that they're going through at the moment um, and provide additional capacity. Um, but it's, it's quite a long-term programme. They're talking about um, increasing capacity over the next seven to ten years. So it's it's a very long-term programme. Um, hopefully, we I don't know the outcome of that engagement that was undertaken pre-Christmas as yet. I think it's only just closed um, this week, I think it was. Um, I'm sure they'll be back in touch. Um, they were disappointed that they were unable to attend. They were quite keen to attend committee. Um, but I have indicated that members have got any further questions or queries um, that we can go back to them and they'll endeavour to get responses to us and um, possibly even attend a future committee. But that would depend on their capacity, you know, given their current circumstances. So mm -hmm. I don't know if members wanted to... Um, take the time to just have a read through the papers that were emailed through yesterday um so it's not a great deal of paperwork to go through um and then if members wanted to get back to me if they've got any queries or any questions or anything they want me to feed back to them whether it's comments um just to get back to me and i'll uh, i'll coordinate those comments and go back to them and um, marjorie well it was me that raised the question around dental practices rather than the orthodontics chair and to be fair prior to sort of this week's lockdown uh what's in the because i have read the the short letter thing that came out yesterday mm. uh and the outline that's there is just not in practice happening um as i said at the previous meeting where i raised it i received from my dentist who is on that list right um a temporary filling in february last year and with the intention to go back a couple of weeks later which was then prevented by the lockdown now if they're supposed to have been providing a service since june last year i can absolutely tell you that that's rubbish right uh because there are dental practices in hartpool that are not providing other than for emergency support any uh, dental services at all so I still have what's left of my temporary filling and when I rang for an appointment which would have been I think I, I mean I'd, I'd rung but they said you know we're in lockdown can't do anything uh, I rang again at the back end of July last year and what I was told very clearly over the phone was that unless I was an emergency requirement then I would not be provided with an appointment and that remains the position that I'm in now. Uh, and when I actually asked, well, what is an emergency appointment for? Oh, well, it's if you've got an infection. I says, well, yeah. I said, but I'm diabetic. I'm not supposed to wait until I have an infection, right? 
and they would need to see physical evidence of an infection, i.e. your face has got to be swollen, right? Now, the uh, so really what they're angling at is they're not doing any dental practice work. What they are doing is they are waiting until their patient is in a position where they are prepared to say, please take the tooth out. It's mm. too painful. Just take the tooth out. They're doing extractions. They are not providing any services. And I find that totally unacceptable. And when I actually pushed the receptionist for a bit more information, he said, well, do you realise that uh, to have a, somebody come in for a filling, say, uh, we would have to wash the whole place down and we'd have to have PPE. I thought, well, everybody else is having PPE. What's your problem? Right. But uh, the, at the moment, the dental practices in Hartlepool, and I'm assuming it's the same all over the country, are just getting away with murder. So instead, they're waiting until you're in a position where you're prepared to have an extraction rather than treatment, which is totally unacceptable. Thank mm. you, Chair. I can back up your comments, uh, Marjorie. There was um, an article in national media as a number of de dentists have recruited as the boxing providers. Um, from um, COVID-19, so uh, even their practice and um, administer injections for the uh, vaccine. I don't know that. Okay, um, Councillor Bob Khan, have you put your hand up? Yes, what it is, I've been waiting now for about three months to have a crown fitted. I have a temporary filling as well and I can't get it done. Hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, it's a comment as well. Um, I know somebody who is 22 and since January the 1st last year has lost almost all of his teeth. Uh, he has type 1 diabetes. Um, he's been in touch with his dentist uh, who actually uh, he's got 10 teeth left in his head. 10. He can hardly eat anything, only soft stuff. And being type 1 diabetic, he's been that since he was five year old. Um, it's worrying. Um, and his dentist wrote to uh, the hospital at Newcastle. Uh, and then apparently they wrote back to the dentist and said, um, there's not enough information. So the lad went back to the dentist and said, you know, what's happening? I got my own GP involved as well. Uh, it, it's been an absolute nightmare. Uh, he was promised that he would have treatment before Christmas and he would have teeth that he could eat with. Here we are, January the 7th, nothing. It's it's absolutely disgraceful. They're just not interested. It's, it's, it, it is a scandal. So I'm going to take it up again myself and see what I can do. It's the only way. Can I just add a comment, Chair? Because so out of the few members that are on this committee, there are at least three of us that have had a bad sort of input from a dentist practice in the town. So if we are representative of the whole of the population of Hartlepool, there must be thousands of people in Hartlepool that are desperate for dental services and they're just not going to get it unless they want their tooth pulled out. I've got a message on the screen that we've got five minutes to the end of the meeting. Um, so thanks for the uh, vote from Angela and maybe we can um, put forward the um, findings. Would, so, would uh, members like me to feed back the information that they've given me, sort of, you know, based on the anonymous information really that we've got so far and then they might want to contact you direct about, about that, specific yeah. complaints? Would members be happy for me to do that? Most definitely, Angela. Yeah. 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 Chair, can I, can I suggest that we actually put something on the council website asking people uh, about their needs for dental treatment and whether they have received any dental treatment in the last 12 months? Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks very much. The final item is um, 7.1, Reaper. That would be Hayley Martin. Uh, no, Chair, it would be myself on that. Oh, you, you do. 
Okay. It's just uh, our regular quarterly report, and just to highlight that there have been uh, no requests um, come forward and no authorizations being made for um, uh, any action under the REAPER regulations. Okay. No comment. Um, 8.1 has been well being brought to receive the minutes held on the 7th of September 2020. Do you approve those or accept it? No, them, Chair. Yep. Nothing on 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, no items. So we look forward to the last meeting on the 11th of February 2021, same time online at 10 o'clock on Thursday. Okay, and thank you for your um, cooperation and comments. Um, we've got a full house in this uh, committee. Um, today. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you, Chair. Bye. 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 David, um, could